Our topic for this afternoon's first panel is Russia's role and goals. Our first speaker this afternoon is uh, Professor uh, Kimitaka Matsuzato. He is a professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Tokyo in Japan. His uh, presentation this afternoon is titled the first four years of the Donetsk People's Republic, differentiating indigenous elites and Surkov's political technologists. Thank you. I will concentrate on the domestic politics of the Donetsk People's Republic. Possibly you know, I am a specialist on uh, unrecognized states. So I will compare uh, DPR with uh, o the old uh, unrecognized uh, states, that is Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno Karabakh, and Pridonistrovia. I conducted uh, fieldwork in Donetsk uh, DPR in 2017, and you will see a similar picture everywhere in the uh, city. So uh, flower beds, flower beds are tended with great care. Uh, after oligarchs abandoned Donetsk, uh, people with middling ranks, for example, uh, school principals, factory engineers, and uh, middle-scale businessmen came to uh, power. They, they became parliamentarians. And uh, uh, beautification of the street, a uh, very important value for this uh, category of people. And of course, this is one of the relief for un unemployment. In the evening, uh, youth play a uh, skateboard. They enjoy skateboard. and. Blasts were heard. Blasts were heard from very near from point, from, from several kilometers away. And since autumn 2013, among Putin's aides, uh, Surkov is responsible for Russia's relations with Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Ukraine. Surkov stations his men in these territories, uh, whom local leaders nickname as Surkov's political technologist, Politotechnology Surkova. And uh, as a rule, they are not so numerous. Uh, in Donetsk, they are perhaps less than, five, uh, less than five. From social origin, I guess that most of them are unsuccessful social scientists who couldn't uh, succeed in uh, universities. Uh, and they are not public figures. Uh, they can't attend parliamentary sessions. They can't be interviewed by foreigners. So uh, they should not exist in these ter territories. So I was surprised to know that many parliamentarians do not know, do not know uh, that they are uh, working in some rooms of the pres presidential administration. So they implement their control only by a conversation with a handful of top leaders, top leaders. So I can't meet him, but I have get very grand, uh, good at relations with this handful of top leaders. So they tell me well, what uh, political te uh, technologists order them. If one of the top leaders uh, declines his privilege to consult with Surkos political technologists, this, uh, po his position will be endangered. endangered because uh, Surkos uh, uh, po political technologists will uh, report to Surkov that this reader is inappropriate, and Surkov will pass that information to Putin, so, which exactly happened with uh, Andrei Purugin in 2015. In contrast, communist leader Litvinov, ousted from DPR parliament, continues to be a relevant figure, perhaps partly because he actively contacts Surkov's political technologies. Surkov is not monopolist in the Kremlin's decision making concerning unrecognized states. The Krem it is often said that the Kremlin has 10 towers and Putin sits amongst them. Harsh intergovernmental competition between policymakers vis-a-vis -vis unrecognized states sometimes results in a proxy war on the spot. For example, in 2014, Surkov supported the state coup d'etat in Abkhazia organized by Abkhaz nationalist Raoul Hadjimba, while the Russian foreign ministry supported the legitimately elected Abkhazian president, Ankubab. As uh, Professor Rich already noted today, DPR has two uh, historical origins. Uh, the first one is uh, inter, uh, uh, inter-movement, inter in the early uh, 1990s, uh, the leader of which were uh, colonial brothers. And the second origin is, of course, it's a resist resistance to the Orange Revolution. 
I would like to emphasize that after the Orange Revolution, after the re their resistance, these leaders, their future DPR leaders in the early stage, at the early stage of the DPR history, history they didn't create a single pro-Russian party, ethnic Russian party. They created their own small, small, funny parties. Uh, all of these organizations were amateurish, not only Yushchenko, but also Yanukovych repressed them mercilessly. Overwhelmed by the party of regions, financial and administrative resources, they became marginal and their activities looked extravagant and fascial, fascial. Uh, I would like to uh, attract your attention to this figure. This is Alexei Alexandrov, who was a leader of uh, uh, Ruskimir Ukraine, Ruskimir Ukraine. He is the most systematic thinker, propagandist of the Ruskimir. And when I interviewed him uh, in summer 2014, he identified, identified himself as a professional revolutionary. And this person uh, became very important uh, officer for the DPR twice. First, as an aide of Borodai. Second, as an aide of uh, Purgin. In my paper, I uh, introduced his uh, uh, thought, uh, but uh, here I would like to summarize his thought as a triad combination, very, very peculiar combination of civilizational imperialism, left leftist-minded trust in people's power, and admiration, Western style admiration of the newest communication technology and soft power. From Hindu side, I understand that his, uh, this triad became the core ideology of the Russian spring. Now, uh, let's move on to the next issue, the, the end of and failure of the Novorussian Confederation. From spring to autumn 2014, the slogan, Novorussia conveyed the anti-Maidan activist wishful desire that separa separation from Ukraine would not end with only Crimea and the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, but continue to expand to cover the whole southeast Ukraine. In May 2014, representatives of the DPR and LPR signed a joint declaration to create the U Union of People's Republic, later renamed to Navarasha. However, this confederation's parliament held only three sessions in June, August 2014, and ceased to function. Why this confederation did not succeed? First reason is that uh, it was Oleg Sarev's project. When Novorossiya's expansion stopped, there was no reason to have the uh, speaker, parliamentary speaker, Tsarev become parliamentary speaker, but he's not from Lugansk, he's not from Donetsk. Why he can be a parliamentary speaker if uh, the confederation is composed of two uh, subjects? Second, there was a competition between Tsarev's and the Purgin's factions in the DPR Supreme Council. The removal of Bordai in August and the appointment of uh, Zaharchenko as the DPR Prime Minister deprived Tsarev uh, su support base. Third, thirdly, Luhansk representatives did their best to make the Confederation purely symbolic. If the com Confederation is only composed of the DPR and LPR, the capital will be placed in Donetsk since the DPR is more significant than the LPR by population size and uh, military strength. Luhansk did not want to become a younger brother of Donetsk again, a de facto status that constantly irritated Luhansk's elite before 2014. As a condition to help the DPR and the LPR, Putin requested their leaders to accept Minsk I, Minsk II, prescribing their eventual uh, uh, reincorporation into Ukraine. Secondly, the Novorussian movement should abandon its initial social revolutionary romanticism against oligarchism and capitalism, uh, dwarfing itself to a geopolitical project resisting EU and NATO expansion. For this purpose, Surukov's political technologists systematically conducted purges. The first target was cheer team leaders from Russia. In August 2014, Alexander Bo uh, Prime Minister Alexander Bozai was replaced with Zaharchenko and the ministry, the defense minister, Igor Strelkov, was replaced by Vladimir Kokonov. The second target was the communists. Strelkov's political te technologies did not allow them to take part in uh, parliamentary elections as a party in November 2014. Instead, they received three parliamentary seats as quota from ruling party 
Donetsk Republic. Это коммунист лидер Литвина, парламентарий чей, мы встретились в августе 2014. Второй таргет был парламентарий чей и лидер социального движения Донецк Республик Андрей Пургин и Алексей Александров, которых я уже говорил ранее, которые были removed в июне 2015. В мае 2016 коммунистские депутаты, которые хотели removed removать Пургин, были депутаты по депутатам мандата. Нон-партия демократии. Тогда в парламентарии в 2014 Through course, the technologists arranged, uh, arranged to regroup various uh, factions into two social movements, Donetsk Republic and Free Donbass. This arrangement was uh, repeated in the uh, 18th election, 2018 election. And Guber, he also could not participate in the election as a party leader. As a result of the, uh, the parliamentary elections, the largest party, Donetsk Republic, gained uh, 68 deputy seats, and the Free Donbass gained 32 deputy seats. So we have something like two-party system in uh, Don DPR. The only legal political party in the DPR is the Communist Party of the DPR. It's either Litovino remarks that the lack of parties and local self-government are serious obstacles to the DPR's state building. Non-party democracy, uh, it's not my uh, word, it's his word. Uh, Non-party democracy does not satisfy international norms of democracy and will disturb international recognition of the DPR. According to Litovino, uh, the DPR's two-party system is easily manageable and somehow, somehow reminds us of the American two-party system. This is not my <laughs> word, he says. Uh, though Donetsk Republic was born in 2005 to resist the Orange Revolution. After becoming the ruling party of the DPR, it quickly lost its ideational uh, features, uh, rep uh, replacing initial romanticism with pragmatism and cultural tendencies. It has already built its youth organization. So CPSU had Komsomol, they have their youth organization too. And now, uh, since Prugin was removed, now party leader is pushing him, pushing him. And he, uh, he grew as a politician very much. So uh, he, when he became uh, the parliamentary speaker for the first time, he was a very weak organizer. He even did not archive papers of the early DPR period. I suffered very much. As a historian, I suffered very much when I studied early DPR history. Uh, but uh, he's now very en uh, he's energetic. He visited many places of the DPR to open the branch of uh, uh, this uh, social move, uh, organization. And Pavel Gubarev, uh, Miroslav Rudenko, and other stars of the Russian Spring of the 2014 created Free Donbass in October 2014. Free, Free Donbass continues to harbor a pan-Russian romanticism and uh, tries to reactivate itself by organized veterans of the Russian Springs. Uh, exactly as Abkhazian Aitaira Aitari is an opposition toward in the late Arzimba period. They organized, Aitaira organized veterans of the Abkhazian Georgian War in the, uh, of the early 1990s. And uh, uh, Karabakh, opposition, Karabakh opposition named itself uh, Movement 88 to stop people's memory of the 1988. As a third social movement, I want to attract your attention to Oplot, this stronghold. Oplot was created, uh, was born in Kharkiv, Kharkiv but Zaharchenko transplanted it to uh, Donetsk. And uh, uh, since the uh, police system was collapsed in uh, Donetsk in March uh, 2014, uh, it patrolled, upload, patrolled the streets. And after May, it became military organization. And in autumn, uh, it became political uh, organization as a support base of Zaharchenko. Since the Donetsk Republic is becoming an ordinary party of power, losing dynamism and often accom accompanied by inter-party struggles, DPR leaders needed a political organization more devoted to the DPR's initial cause and Zaharchenko himself. Upload plays this role. 
this is the last topic, war crimes and NGOs. As early as May uh, 2014, several lawyers in the DPL, such as Elena Shishkina, this woman, and Vitaly uh, Galahov, started to ascertain and record cases of destruction, death, injury, torture, and other war crimes committed by the Ukrainian army and the paramilitaries uh, in the DPR territory. Since Ukraine had not and has not uh, ratified the Roma, uh, Rome Statute of the uh, International Criminal Court, the lawyers did not know how to use these materials. What inspired them was the historical experience of the Extraordinary State Commission for Asserting and Investigating Crimes uh, perpetrated by German fascist occupiers and their collaborators established by the president of the USSR, Supreme Soviet, in November 1942. The Nuremberg trials uh, used uh, these materials collected by the, this commission. In September 2015, Ukraine declared its readiness to recognize the ICC's jurisdiction concerning the crimes uh, taking place in Ukraine after February 20, 2014. After this declaration, the ICC uh, procurator began to accept materials submitted by Donetsk lawyers too. Well, let me uh, compare uh, this, uh, Donetsk uh, NGO's activities with uh, the similar activities in Karabakh. So Karabakh's case of war crimes during the April 2016 war. Uh, so uh, according to Karabakh's argument, uh, Azerbaijanis beheaded three uh, soldiers and uh, other many uh, uh, crimes. But uh, of course, uh, Azerbaijanis say that it was uh, falsified information and uh, what, uh, what, what Armenians did was a uh, war crime. So if we uh, compare uh, their activities, uh, Karabakh lawyers prefers to uh, send compliments to European Court of Human Rights but uh, DPR, International Criminal Court, because uh, European Court of Hu for Human Rights uh, imposes very strict time limit. So uh, plaintiff, plaintiffs should send a uh, complaint with uh, materials and evidence within six months uh, of, the event, of the event. But uh, 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 this war, April 16th war, continued only for four days. Now after that, uh, Karabakh party and Azerbaijan party could uh, collect materials and uh, evidence, but DPR cannot collect, DPR lawyers, lawyers cannot collect materials because the war continues. Uh, so they prefer ICC and uh, their preference did not change after, as you know, P Putin, Russia uh, left I ICC in, uh, in 2016. And, uh, Karabakh citizens are very privileged. They can send the compla complaints in the name of Karabakh citizens. But uh, DPR citizens, of course, they can't send uh, complaints with, uh, as, as civilians of DP DPR, the civil citizens of C DPR. So they use the international, international law status and they send complaints as a Ukrainian citizens. And uh, uh, local authorities, Karabakh government support, very supported. Karabakh government is very supported. For example, uh, Karabakh human rights defender, uh, Merikian, Merikian, he collects and publishes uh, materials and he held a uh, press conference at the European Parliament. But uh, DPR human rights ombudsman, Daria, Morozova does not seem to play active role for uh, this purpose. And the pattern, Armenia, very supportive, very supportive. Russia, indifferent. Uh, excuse me, uh, D DPR, lawyers applied for Russian presidential grant for NGO to prevent uh, Russian NGOs receiving money from the foreign NGOs, uh, the president, oh, but uh, they failed. Uh, they applied for Russian president NGO grant, but they failed. Okay, so thank you for. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much.
Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tatiana Maliarenko. She's a professor of international security and the Jean Monnet Professor of European Security at the National University Odessa Law Academy in Ukraine. Her presentation today is titled The Logic of Competitive Influence Seeking, Russia, Ukraine, and the Conflict in Donbass. I would like to, uh, to give you some background information about my research. I started originally, I'm from Donetsk, I like Oksana, we work <laughs> at the same university for many years. <laughs> and I started uh, this research in uh, 2014 um, as a part of my research grant in NATO Defense College in Rome. It was purely technical research on different kinds of tactics of destabilization and covered occupation, in particular type of conflict, low intensity conflict. At, and it was a huge concern in NATO countries regarding Baltic countries that Russia could repeat the same uh, operation and uh, cover occupation uh, like it was in Donbass. So the main research question was, are the tactics are unique or something Russia used something new in Donbass war? And after, in some years, we recently published an article on post-Soviet affairs. Uh, you can find it in open access in the journal. We uh, try to link more this very technical aspect of Russian involvement in conflict with usage of different uh, mercenaries, uh, local fighters, removement of government, elite, social destabilization with uh, Russian military doctrine, uh, so-called Gerasimov doctrine and uh, with Russian geopolitics. What we have now, we have conflict uh, artificially designed and escalated by involvement of external party between the sides, Donbass and Kyiv, which before did not have any uh, contradictions and any secession or separatist attitude from the side of Donbass. Unlike Crimea, where opinion pool demonstrate clear uh, separatist attitude for many years. In Donbass, uh, there were such uh, intentions. It was a very strong local elite. It was consolidated society. It was wish for autonomy. But it was mostly Ukrainian project with different vision of how Ukrainian state should look like. But from later 2013, to early 2015, the conflict escalated. It was transformed from, from very passive local anti-Maidan protest. Of course, majority of population did not agree with Maidan. Again, opinion pool showed that about 80% of population, they consider Maidan, Yera Maidan, as a legal cop. And they did not support Maidan, but it does not mean that local population wanted to separate from Ukraine. And Russia was able to escalate this conflict to early 2014 and uh, actually from conflict escalated by different stage in 2000 and 2015, uh, 14 and 15, it was full conventional type of war with usage of artillery, tanks, and uh, different position. And now conflict develops. We cannot say that it's stable conflict. And major concern uh, Ukrainian military, who also study, of course, this conflict, that this is younger generation of uh, youth who live on the occupied territories, who were born or grew during the, the conflict, and they are under this intensive pressure of Russian propaganda, and of course, everyday war experience. And in Eastern Front, Ukrainian military say that these younger guys, they are absolutely fanatic suicide fighters, so they uh, don't have the same motivation as more adult people who have experience to live in Ukraine, who can compare life. So the, we cannot say that this conflict is stable. It's a very clear trend of evolution of this conflict. And also, we can say that this conflict, in definition, is so-called blended conflict. 
What does blended mean? That a conflict with the involvement of different actors from the local level, national and global level. And this conflict take place in antagonistically penetrated regions. So Russia and the West compete for influence for Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and they want to promote for uh, part of European Union, it's democracy promotion prog program from uh, side of Russia, it's autocracy promotion. So they compete for influence in this region and if, for example, guys in Donetsk and Kyiv suddenly in some hypothetical situa situation they find some common solution, uh, it's unlikely that this conflict will be end because both Russia and West uh, try to, uh, they play zero sum game and they have more uh, high level conflict about themselves. What is theoretical framework for this research? First, um, we have two existing explanations of Russia policy, drivers of Russia policy in Ukrainian conflict. They not necessarily contradict but they both are popular. First explanation that uh, Russia uh, does not have strategy in Donbass war. It just used some opportunistic opportunities to implement the interests. And uh, if you read some publications and uh, also Russian expert publication, they say this Donbass war in Donbass, it was a series of mistakes, miscalculations, wrong consumption, which Russian government did that actually did not expect some development on the ground. They hope for different uh, projects for Novorossiya, for UK Kiev will to uh, compromise with Russia. And actually, uh, my expert, uh, whom we interview from Russia, Russian military expert, they say that uh, it was actually the case that this operation in Donbass was mostly implemented by FSB. Involvement of military Russian army was not planned. So they involved in August of 2014 just to save face because FSB failed. The Ukrainian army started to take some cities to restore control of the territory. So just to save this operation, uh, Russian military army intervened in August 2014. This argument in support that Russia does not have strategy, they tried to destabilize Kharkiv or, or Odessa. And when this attempt failed, they tried to, did, to do something in Donbass. The second explanation that Russia has strategy and this very long-term geopolitical strategy fighting for friendly neighborhood. Very classical work of Russian geopolitics, Yerozhenists, and Vadim Simbursky, for example, that uh, Russia has to be surrounded by friendly political, uh, political regimes. And uh, Russia wants to establish friendly political regime in Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, just to rely on them in its security. So for Russia, it's a security question to have friendly political regime in Iran. Then you can see the quote from Sergei Lavrov, and you can find a lot of such quotes in the internet, that Ukraine has to be peaceful, stable, and Russia-friendly, of course, state. So if uh, Russia cannot achieve pro-Russian friendly Ukraine, what are other options? Other options is to have friendly and unstable country, for example, Moldova. So it's generally friendly but unstable with frequent changes, attitudes and regime. To have unfriendly and stable is the last list in the list of Russia wishes. So to have unfriendly but stable country. And the third one is unfriendly and unstable. So Russia wants to destabilize Ukraine in order to prevent the consolidation of anti-Russian or pro-Western political regime. And war in Donbass is one of the tools to destabilize Ukraine. And uh, in support of this argument, again, you may find a lot of uh, open statement of Russian high-level politician. And I like uh, quote Zahar Prilepin, who one of uh, official spe speakers of People Republic. And he said that Russia is fighting not for Donbass, but it's fighting for Ukraine. And if we recognize Donbass, 
then you, we will lose Ukraine. Ukraine will go to other direction and we will not be able to keep it in our orbit. So Donbass war is uh, one of the tool how to destabilize Ukraine, how to keep situation unstable, not only Donbass war, for example, and other, a number of other tools, but the major, major purpose is uh, this one. What was the approach and methodology? The question of methodology and research is very sensitive, and we raise this uh, question today because, and for me and for other researchers, it's a big issue how to collect data in the zone of armed conflict, and can we trust? To, to what people say when they live in uh, the war-affected territory. Recently, we find uh, a lot of research published, sometimes very famous analytical center, when they just call to people by phone who live in Donetsk and Lugansk, and they ask, do you support uh, Ukraine? Do you want to return to Ukraine? Or do you support this uh, government? Or how do you feel? That, of course, we cannot trust to such information because people live in a condition of armed conflict conflict and they are afraid to say what they think. They, if, in particular, if they move between Russia, Ukraine, and the occupied territory, they try to accommodate the same. So it's absolutely different logic, logic of individual survival in the condition of war. In our case, it's easy because we talk with expert people who are not, not maybe not in, expert in this question, and people who are directly involved in decision makers. It was more easy in 2014 because they were more open to interview. Now, of course, in the Ukraine and People's Republic and Russia, they built a very strong security system, monitoring system, and uh, not only individual monitoring, so they tr ask people to report about every suspicious activity and people who ask questions different, or, and they also uh, use uh, this computer monitoring system. So uh, all providers who work in People Republic, they have to monitor uh, your searches in the internet, and they have to report to Ministry of uh, State Security about this activity. So now, to, to, up to today, they built very strong uh, intelligence system, and it's very difficult to conduct any research on the occupied territories. Particular issue in our research, we not always can discover sources of our information, because if we interview high-level Ukrainian senior military officers or Russian military officers or People Republic, leaders of People Republic, we cannot put them in the list of interview because our own security question. But of course, sometimes we, we, we did such research. So what, what can we say about this conflict? So all stages of conflict escalation are clearly linked to uh, four agreements. And we can observe that after every agreement, it was, uh, or failure of agreement, it was stage of conflict escalation. And if we look on Russian policy, again we can see that uh, Russian policy and Russian attitude and Russian demands, they became more clear and clear from agreement to agreement. In Kyiv agreement between Yanukovych and leaders of opposition, Russian envoy participated, but even did not sign the, the text of agreement, so Russia did not have clear vision of what to do and what its interest. In Geneva agreement, there were, there were some general statement about uh, peaceful dialogue, reconciliation, some territorial changes in the country. In Minsk Adin, uh, Minsk one after after uh, involvement of army, it was clear demand for special status for this Donetsk and Lugansk People Republic, and Minsk two there were also more clear uh, territorial political organization demands for reorganization of Ukrainian state. So Russia developed and Russia make more clear its requirement and uh, its vision to Ukrainian state. And also in the case of destabilization, we can see that uh, three 
type of destabilization and occupation took place during the conflict development. And uh, from the first stage, it was mostly invasion of mercenary. We call it nomadic occupation. What is nomadic? Because there were a group of uh, mercenaries who enter Ukrainian territory from Russia, Strelkov, Cossacks, and other troops, and they create vision of some uh, local activity. They, uh, they did not uh, control separate part of uh, territory, maybe some occasional cities. Strelkov, for example, was based in Slavyansk, and they attacked uh, Ukrainian, some small troops, police, local population, they create house. So main, major, major tactic was to destabilize this region, to create panic, to create vision that it's local protest. The uh, second type of occupation which led to Minsk one, it was creeping occupation. So they tried to capture more territories and unite them under one control. Because uh, this war, they are uh, brought to the situation when local, most local elite escape, and some small piece of uh, territory were controlled by warlords. Bidnov, Mazgavoy, other guys, and they established their own rule on this territory in which Russia was not interested. So they wanted to shape the territory before neg negotiation about its status in Minsk. And after so-called entrenching occupation, so the institution building in self-declared republic. When Minsk II collapsed, it's no implementation of Minsk II, there is ne it's necessary to uh, Built some institution. It's about 3.5 million population who live there. You have to provide security, stability, to pay some pensions, uh, to provide these people with job. So they started to entrench, build uh, uh, local media, education, propaganda, security system. So to create proper de facto states on these territories. What kind of conclusion can uh, we make after? After our research, the first uh, that this uh, goal of Russia was to uh, push Ukraine to push Kiev to some agreement. So this establishment of de facto states republic was not a final goal. So they were used as destabilization tool to talk with Kiev as the argument. And uh, as this implementation of Russia goals uh, faced some obstacles, it's actually increased the stake. It's involved more and more violence and uh, more uh, demands. And the uh, prospect for future, I'm very pessimistic here. I don't think uh, we, we, we can see that a lot of discussion, peacekeepers or some other forms of reintegration. I, I think that uh, it, it will not be the case. And Minsk agreement is the end point. So it's not implementation of Minsk will actually make the situation st in status quo situation. And the violence will continue. And the uh, uh, battle between Russia in the Ukraine and Russia in the West, not necessarily military, but maybe sometimes military, will continue in the future. And what is important to study and uh, to take uh, in mind is uh, uh, this policy of this stabilization, destabilization, how to manage instability. For Ukraine, it's critically important to create a resilient state and society. Because, to be honest, Ukrainian society in state itself not very resilient. We cannot say that it's a very strong democratic country of Ukraine is fighting against the murder of Russia, because Ukraine itself has a lot of problems, a lot of contradictions, and uh, in, in different segments of economy, in society, and state apparatus, which could be used for destabilization by external or internal forces. So the major task, task is to create resilient state, democratic state and resilient society. And of course, to study this different, different uh, sorts of intentional destabilization tactics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Sergei uh, Suhankin. He's a fellow at the Jamestown Foundation in Washington, DC. He's an associate expert at the International Center for Policy Studies in Kiev, and he's a consultant with the European Parliament's Committee on Foreign Affairs. His topic today 
is continuing war by other means, the case of Wagner, Russia's premier private military company. Thank you very much. I've been thinking about the topic, and uh, it was the last call when I, it was the last moment when I decided to change the topic uh, from the one that was presented by Heather Coleman uh, to another one. It's virtually similar to the one, but uh, it bears slightly different um, accent. It's Russian PMC's private military companies in Ukraine, how the steel was tampered. And I changed this topic primarily because of my uh, uh, latest conference, in, it was a major security conference in Istanbul, uh, and I had a privilege of uh, talking to one of uh, the policy, former policy advisors to the Iraqi government. And during our conversation, he said, gee, well, what Russia did in Ukraine, well, in many ways, uh, they drew some lessons from the Arab Spring, and indeed, what we saw, how the conflict in Ukraine, how it unraveled, how it unfolded, in many ways it followed uh, the outbreak and the subsequent developments in the Middle East. Uh, and today we've, we've uh, uh, heard a lot of definitions uh, of the conflict in Ukraine, a hybrid warfare, a blended conflict. Well, I think the, uh, from military strategic point of view, the most appropriate definition that can be applied to this conflict uh, is a classical nonlinear conflict with an emphasis of, on asymmetric measures, which basically stems from writings not only uh, Mr. General Gerasimov, but also top-notch uh, Russian military experts uh, who are writing about uh, hybrid confrontation, nonlinear confrontation. At this juncture, uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that uh, already in 2010, uh, the way how the conflict in Ukraine, how it would develop, uh, it was preordained. In many ways, the Arab Spring, the lessons of the Arab Spring, were the key driver, the key motivator of the Russian side when they engaged in this conflict. So uh, given the sensitivity, high sensitivity of the topic, uh, and the fact that there is a lot of classified information that cannot be revealed uh, unless this is not the uh, Chatham House rules. Uh, so I try to uh, choose some middle path and I will combine probably some historical aspects with some uh, policy related uh, elements. So the plan that I will be following today, uh, it consists of four main parts or four main chapters. First of all, I will speak uh, I will disclose some general aspects pertaining to the Russian-style irregular warfare. Secondly, I will discuss some key aspects uh, related to Russian PMCs, what they are, why are they so interesting a phenomenon, and why they are indispensable for the Russian government. Thirdly, I will uh, obviously spend some time talking on Ukraine, how it was uh, being done, uh, how it was being implemented in Ukraine. And in the end, in scopes of my conclusive remarks, uh, I will um, identify why the Ukrainian example uh, is so pertinent and so important uh, when we are talking, when we are studying Russian PMCs. Well, first of all, the general aspects of Russian irregular warfare. Well, if we take a look at Russian history, we'll see that uh, employment of irregular f formations, irregular uh, uh, f forces, uh, has been par part and parcel of uh, the Russian statehood at different uh, historical epochs, at, di at different historical uh, times. Uh, it was relevant both in the imperial Russia, so before 1917, it was a part and parcel of the Soviet foreign policy, and of course after 1991 uh, with uh, the revolution military affairs after the Iraqi war, uh, of course, the Russian side tried to integrate, tried to implement uh, some of the basic lessons learned uh, by Americans in Iraq and by the Chinese, of course, uh, into their uh, architecture, into their, um, uh, the way how future wars will be waged. The variables, of course, they varied, forms, methods of use, goals, theaters, even the names. Uh, this has undergone profound transformations, but the essence, the essence was there, the essence was preserved. So conditionally, we can separate uh, Soviet and of course Russian uh, types, uh, Russian way of uh, waging irregular conflicts on three main parts. So the first part, 
the period that started in 1944, sorry, from 1991. And it could be called as military advisors period, uh, where we can see a strong ideological pivot uh, and broad geographical coverage of uh, conflicts and application by the Soviet Union uh, of irregular forms of warfare, asymmetric forms of warfare. The second phase uh, could conditionally be called as peacekeeper spirit from 1991 uh, until the Five Day War in 2009. So uh, the best examples here would be the civil war in Tajikistan, Transnistria, the Russo-Georgian War, uh, and the most distinctive traits, the most distinctive characteristics of this period are premised on geopolitical pivots uh, overcoming the uh, antecedent ideological compound and the fact that the key wars, the main developments were taking place in the so-called near abroad. And phase number three, and this is the most relevant part uh, and it pertains to our discussion today, is the, is the period of private military contractors, so private military companies, uh, something that was initiated in 2012, and I think this phenomenon is th there to stay for a long, long time, uh, because it has proven its effectiveness and efficiency both in Ukraine and beyond Ukraine. So the Balkans, Syria, the Sahel region, the Sub-Saharan Africa, Yemen, and Ukraine are the main theaters where uh, this type of warfare, where it has succeeded, where it has been implemented. And Ukraine occupies, undoubtedly it occupies, a very special place. Uh, well, this is the place where uh, Russia started to implement, started to integrate in practical terms uh, this concept, this new type of warfare, which is in fact a hybrid between the first and the second stage. And as uh, General uh, Valery Gerasimov was mentioned today, well, what he got to say about Russia's use of asymmetric form of warfare, uh, unconventional form of warfare, he said that reliance on traditional and non-conventional forms of warfare as partisan or guerrilla warfare has historically secured Russian military victories. And in many ways, this is, this is the truth. Uh, the second aspect, what are Russian PMCs and why they are so remarkable? What is so interesting about Russian PMCs? Well, within 1997 and uh, 2012, uh, Russia saw um, approximately a dozen of various PMCs. They were disorganized. In fact, the Russian side tried to implement certain aspects during the first Balkan War in the early 90s where under the guise of volunteers, uh, the Russian Cossacks uh, poured to the theater, but uh, they were, well, the extent of successfulness, it could be quite uh, arguable. The first real Russian PMC was the Slavonic Corps Limited, which was organized in 2013 in uh, uh, its first mission, its real mission in Syria, uh, it became a tragedy for uh, this PMC. The organization was destroyed, uh, but it gave the rise to the one of the most, probably the most uh, well-known Russian PMC, the Wagner Group, which I will uh, speak about later. And there is a, deal, a great deal of confusion that pertains to Russian PMCs. So, de facto, Russia does not have PMCs. They are mercenaries. They are legally prohibited. But de, de facto, so de facto, this is an integral part of Russian foreign and security policy. This is a part of so-called security export concept that was recently proclaimed uh, during the Waldai summit, but of course had started to be implemented much, much earlier. So here are three main functions of Russian PMCs uh, that they are serving today. First of all, uh, while Donald Trump is making uh, America great again, the Russian side is making the war profitable again. The disappointing uh, experience of the wars of the first Chechen war, of uh, the Georgian war, when the wars were unprofitable, well, today, this is changing. The Russians are what we could see uh, in Syria, for example, uh, or in Libya. The Russian side is trying to make wars profitable. So the first function is economic function. And here is an essential concept 
I think the most important concept uh, that pertains to, to this entire architecture of uh, Russian PMCs is the power economy. So what is a power economy? A power economy is a state-controlled system of coercion, including a reliance on limited-scale military conflicts, if necessary, aimed at uh, realizing economic goals. The second function is geopolitical function, so promotion Russian interests abroad, which we can see today in Yemen, we can see in the Central African Republic, in uh, the Sahel zone uh, with Yemen. And the final one, the third function, also very important, something that was tested in Ukraine, the military strategic function, the military operative function, sort of the asymmetric response in terms of network, uh, network centric warfare, something, the concept that uh, Russian military and Russian political elite, uh, elites are obsessed with. So the Russian side sees a uh, Russian chance to withstand uh, a military superior party that is acting in scopes of uh, NCV as uh, being able to provide an asymmetric response. And irregular forms is seen one of the key pillars of this response. Uh, Russia's use PMCs in Ukraine. Right now, the corollary, the main conclusion of Russia's use of PMCs. The actual presence of the Wagner Group, of the Yenot Corps, uh, the Cossacks in Ukraine, is by far less important than the effect it has had on the development, evolution, and transformation of Russian PMCs after its uh, Ukrainian chapter, Ukrainian voyage. The irregular groups uh, that were used by Russia uh, rested on three main pillars. First of all, the Wagner Group, secondly, the Yenot Corps, and thirdly, the Cossacks. The Cossacks were, of course, poorly trained, and they were primarily operating in the Lugansk People's Republic, whereas uh, the Wagner Group and the Yenot Corps Limited, they performed military, they carried out military operations in the Donetsk People's Republic and played in many ways, essential role in terms of the derailment of plans of the Ukrainian army, which was poorly trained and poorly organized, as was uh, noted today. It is uh, very little known about the actual uh, scope of actions that were carried out by Russian PMCs. It is known for certain that they played primarily, first of all, they played uh, an auxiliary, uh, auxiliary functions. Uh, they took part in annexation of Crimea. They were allegedly involved in assassination of uh, Lugansk People's Republic Minister of Defense uh, Bidnov, alleged killing of Mazgavoy, disarmament of the Odessa mechanized brigade, and wide-scale repressions against the Cossacks in the Lugansk People's Republic. It's been said that it was FSB that stood behind this organization. Well, my personal research, my own research, again, this might be slightly different from what it has been said, that it was the GRU that stood behind the Wagner Group and Russian PMCs. Why? Well, it's uh, easily uh, deducible from its history. Uh, the Wagner Group had its main polygon, the main training ground uh, at Molkina Polygon, Krasnodar Krai, uh, which was held, uh, which was the property of the GRU 10th Elite Brigade, uh, and the major renovation works were done by the Ministry of Defense. So, again, this is a part of different uh, research that I'm doing. FSB might be involved in operations in Syria. Uh, and in other places, but when it comes to Ukraine, I think GRU and the Ministry of Russian Ministry of Defense were the key actors that stood behind this, uh, these PMCs. Uh, and the final part, why this is so important, why we need to study uh, activities of Russian PMCs in Ukraine, even though that was the first, the initial point uh, from which Russian PMCs started to sort of maturing process. Well, first of all, it was a, a testing ground for PMCs of non-Western forms of asymmetric warfare. What we know about Western PMCs, well, what are their range of responsibilities? They're mostly doing with military consultancy, training, but what we could see in Ukraine, what we saw subsequently in Syria, was sort of, it, it's not a new type of warfare. But this is something new that has been performed by private military companies. Ordinary or normal private military companies, they don't tend to be engaged in uh, offensive, even limited uh, military operations. They simply don't do that. 
out of Ukraine, this, this good action has been uh, transferred to other theaters. And we, we've seen this all over the world, at least in places that are uh, gray zones rich in natural resources. Secondly, it could have prospective impact in Ukraine. As uh, Vasily Gritsak said, uh, the Russian SBU also, GRU, they were involved in training of uh, some of the militants, some of the irregulars in Ukraine. And today there are different, well, the opinions uh, figures, they differentiate, of course, but over 200,000 Ukrainians have had uh, certain fighting experience in Ukraine. And given the fact that Ukrainian PMCs are not well organized, or basically don't have Ukrainian PMCs, just one, but it's uh, not as active and not as important as the Russian ones, some of those people could actually uh, be tempted to join Russian PMCs that have been, that have been quite successful uh, in spite of Dale and Zor uh, in Syria, but still they, they did fulfill their functions. Third, the evolution of Russian PMCs. Well, it started from Ukraine, but it was picked up by other uh, companies, by other similar companies. We have the Patriot PMC that is operating in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is not involved in uh, military confrontation, but mostly serves as uh, standard Western PM or Israeli PMCs. And military patriotic upbringing, I think this is the most overlooked topic and I don't have time for that, uh, but just Yenot Corps, uh, it's involved in uh, the Balkan affairs, it's training Serbian and Bosnian youth. It's introducing anti-Western values to the Balkans, it's heroization of volunteering. Uh, it's a very important trend. And finally, and finally, yes, uh, other theaters. We have other destabilized zone in Europe. We have Moldova, Transnistria. We have the Balkans, which, has, which uh, have historically been the powder keg of Europe. We have other places. So uh, on this, thank you. Thank you to our three speakers for, I really think, three very rich papers. And uh, I'm not going to make any extensive comments, although I do think that one of the really interesting questions here is, is this reminds me of, of Kremlinology. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out how the Russian state works and how the different where power lies and and how how different groups are are, are influencing this um, this conflict, and we don't have any uh, Russian scholars participating in today's. Oh, you are Russian, okay? <laughs> but people working people working in Russian Russia can't <laughs> can't probably work on this topic. It is an interesting situation where we're we're. Um, both uh, people are worried about about revealing their sources, and uh, we're trying to sort of figure out how that state is working from the outside, from evidence. So anyway, I won't say any more, but we'll uh, open the floor to questions. When is it known that Wagner Group entered the Ukrainian battle scene? It's the first question. And I've seen some web evidence from the insurgent side by Russian volunteers that they were operating at Lugansk airport in late August. And the second question is, what's the size of these units? Girkin, in one of his 2017 interviews, said that there were two, two to three battalion combat groups. So that's probably about maybe 15 to 2,000 fighters, if we are optimistic, if that's true. I don't know. Sergeant Jason Tavenorm from Canadian Forces Base Edmonton here, so I'm not associated with any university, just University of Firearms. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, my question is actually for Sergey, and actually uh, uh, Alexander asked the first half of my question is if there was any indication of the, the size of these PMCs that are operating in Ukraine. Uh, the second part of my question is with these PMCs, now there's been a lot of documented evidence about electronic, cyber, and psychological warfare conducted by militants within the country. Is any of that actually connected to these PMC organizations? First question to Kimitaka. I was kind of intrigued uh, that uh, in D DPR they allowed only one party, but the two movements that are represent in the so-called parliament are actually yes. not political parties. Why would that be? Why they're not called political parties but social movements? Mm -hmm. Second question, Sergey. Uh, you mentioned Yenot. You mentioned Wagner, uh, and I was very surprised in the summer when I heard these names in the summer of 14. I learned about them from YouTube. 
and on their YouTube channels, they were posting their videos of them participating in the armed conflict in Ukraine. So apparently they were very open about their participation. Why would that be? Why would they try to display their participation so openly? And final question, um, so nomadic occupation. I've been doing field research over the last couple of months in Donbass and different towns, and every town I go, I ask this question, how many armed people did you see in your town? And how many of them do you think were Russians? And the further you go from Slavyansk, the fewer and fewer you have armed people, and you almost have none, no Russians, okay? So Kramatorsk, there were max 50 people who were armed for the city that is 150,000 population. Now you can probably occupy the, pro uh, the campus of University of uh, Alberta with 50 armed people. You cannot occupy Kramatorsk with 50 armed people. So there were other things that were very important to explain why actually you saw the flag of DPR on that city council and why there was no possibility to conduct presidential elections and so on. And from what I learned, uh, the role of police was crucial, the defection and mass of the police, the role of the local businessmen was very important, they provided resources, and the role of local political elites uh, who were providing uh, um, names of voters, for example, for roles for the referendum, etc. Uh, was it an nomadic occupation or was it self-occupation? I don't know. A uh, question to Tatiana. Uh, have you noticed any forms of hidden separatism or insurgency in Odessa? and other cities in southeastern Ukraine that are under Ukrainian control? And if there is any, how, like what kind of tools are they using? What are they doing? Question about Kharkiv, because we, we had very, very similar situation, but why not it happened in Kharkiv? First difference was the role of local elite. You mentioned absolutely true that local elite de de demonstrate different behavior of in Kharkiv in, in Donetsk. Because in Kharkiv, local elite started to cooperate with Poroshenko very quickly. And you have to say uh, thank you to Dobkin and Kernes, who find uh, common ground with uh, Poroshenko. Donetsk elite, they try to blackmail Kyiv, new government in Kyiv, and they imitate uh, some protest. We also look on people who participate in this local protest in Donetsk, and nobody believe in that because we know that it's a kind of performance that people occupy themselves like uh, Lukyanchenko occupied Donetsk Municipal Council and uh, it was just a role play. So Donetsk elite, they used uh, this situation, this People's Republic to blackmail Kyiv with separatism. But the main uh, the problem that they lost control they lost control. And they, it was a very clear difference between uh, Strelkov and uh, uh, local uh, fighters. Because Strelkov was a person who started to kill. You say that you could not ca calculate these people with guns. I was in Donetsk from in, in all this region. I traveled between cities. I live uh, very close to airport. And uh, my dacha is very close to Ilovaisk. So I was in the first round of theater of this war. And I could, of course, you, I did not ask for passport. Are they Russian or what? But you, if you have some experience, you cannot recognize uh, professional military from civilian guy with uh, arms. Of course, in Slavians in Kramatorsk, I, I don't have time, but you, again, you can read my article. And I can explain how in Strelkov troops, troops, it was about 300 mercenaries in the beginning, and was about 3,000 when they occupied Donetsk in the July 5, 2014. Including the locals? Uh, not so many. I, I met these guys, uh, again, I told you, I met these guys in hospital on the first day when they occupied Donetsk. Locals not from Abkhazia and not from Asia. They are very different, look look like very differently. And they were uh, not, not. What's the share of the uh, It's impossible to calculate, impossible to calculate this, this people. I cannot say that local did not participate. I cannot say. Local, local elite, uh, their behavior, they facilitate this, uh, this situation. Because in the best case, they just waited for more clear situation. Maybe it will be annexation. In the worst case, they, like Nelia Stepa, 
they try to to help uh, to these troops and after they change the behavior so the situation in Donbass was very difficult and it is not only fault of local uh, local guys local elite and also fault of Kiev who failed to propose uh, cooperation with them because Kiev also played there are some game they did not want scenario after orange revolution when Ukrainian uh, eastern Ukrainian elite Yanukovych and part of the region returned to power and they want uh, to cut them to remove them from political s uh, sphere of country and uh, they did not propose any compromise so it was zero sum game from the Kiev and local elite they were captured so on the one hand the Kiev who promised to take all this business and remove them from and put them in a prison and second is Russia they were not pro-Russian so they just were very silent and they silence facilitate this, uh, this, uh, this situation in Donbass. Let me first content uh, what Sergei said about 50 persons uh, which is impossible to uh, conduct any military operations. Well, if you remember the outbreak of the Afghan war, 1979, the Operation Grom, which was carried out by Russian Force of Special Operations, it involved 63 persons, uh, and it was the storm of uh, uh, Amin's palace, uh, which had close to 3.5 thousand people of uh, Mujahideen, well, not Mujahideen yet, uh, but fighters. It was successful. It was successfully captured. One night, but you don't control the city for three yeah. months with 50 armed people. Of course not. Then the, then the amount swells, of course, yes. But the military operation itself, the military task can be performed by 50, 60 persons, especially uh, in scopes of uh, contemporary warfare. It requires more people. But first you have to be, as Lenin said in Trotsky, first you have to be really successful. The city is on your side, unless the city is on your side. Or if they are ambulant. <laughs> which is the, the most important thing here. About the Wagner Group and the number of people involved, it's a million dollar question. Uh, no one actually knows the number of people and uh, given my own research, so I had some interviews with people who were in a way, in a way involved uh, in this affair. They were discreet, they are super discreet. I'd say that uh, in 2015, the number of Wagner Group was 2,375 persons. Before that, of course, two, three battalions, probably yes. Probably your, your date is very, very close to uh, being the truth. Well, no one knows the truth. For later. Yeah. Uh, it's known for certain that the Wagner Group, they did take part uh, in seizure of Crimea. But they performed their uh, auxiliary role. So they were not the main uh, actor, not the main player there. Information warfare. Well, if we take a look at classical example of hybrid conflict or a nonlinear conflict, how does it start? Well, it starts from information warfare. And in the Russian reading of information, it's not information warfare. When we are talking about the Russian perspective, it's information confrontation. And this is the most essential difference from information warfare. Information confrontation is perpetual, and it consists of cyber consists of information, propaganda, or disinformation, and thirdly, it consists of uh, EV capabilities. You are absolutely right that all of these three were used in the Donbass. The functions, of course, they were different. They were different. Of course, the Wagner Group or uh, PMCs or irregulars, they could not po possibly have uh, carried out information campaign. It's impossible. That was organized, that was coordinated by the Russian government. EV, yes, certainly, yeah. Krasucha and other means, well, you know them, uh, that, uh, of course, again, getting back to Sergei, uh, when you said that Wagner and the Yenot Corps Limited, uh, they were posting their videos on uh, YouTube, I'm not certain that it was the Wagner Group that was posting its videos, because w the Wagner Group was one of the most discreet uh, PMC. In fact, there is so little known about the Wagner Group and was so little known about the Wagner Group, but in case of Yenot, you're absolutely right. Why? Well, they have different functions. The Yenot Corps, they are actually, they are trying to uh, enhance, they're trying to uh, become sort of a global player, not just the Russian player. What they're doing in Serbia, the Zlatibor affair, for example, uh, when the youth patriotic military camp was closed down, well, the, the Yenot Corps was saying everywhere, yes, we are uh, trying to integrate, we are trying to implement our values beyond Russia. 
it's sort of advertisement. That's what they do. I think that uh, parties were excluded from the DPR political <laughs> system in order to create, control, create controllable political system with some element of pluralism. pluralism. Uh, first of all, it was necessary to uh, wipe out leftist dreams, leftist dreams which uh, DPR uh, initially had. It was very important to exclude communists from elections in 2014. This is the first purpose. And I suppose that if uh, Gubarev created his own party and participated in the election, uh, he will become less controllable, less controllable. But if uh, include him in the social movement, free Donbass, free Donbass, the situation will be more controllable. And uh, I was rather surprised by the fact that in the second parliamentary elections, uh, Russia did not, did not allow uh, or plot participate in, to participate in the election. I think that this, this is because uh, Oplot and uh, uh, Donetsk Republic, Donetsk Republic has many overlapped membership, overlapped membership. It's a very in interesting factor. As a leader of Donetsk Republic, they wear ordinary suits, and uh, they change suits from suits to camo, ca camo suits, and uh, they participate in the activities of op Oplot. So uh, still, post-revolutionary policy, DPR post-revolutionary policy. So we should uh, eliminate the leftist factors and the revolutionary romanticism, but at the same time, uh, we need to give some, uh, some, uh, some uh, appearance of uh, former dreams, former uh, act activists, former, former dreams. Question about Odessa that according uh, Donbass Odessa it's different. According to opinion pool, Odessa it's even more pro Russian than Don Donbass, even recent opinion pool. Because Donbass it's a case of regional identity. Odessa there is no such case of regionalism. But I don't think it will be some strong separatist movement, in particular right now. Because first this experience of Donbass is very evident for everyone. It's uh, a kind of prevent, preventive measure for others. And second is important that there is no local elite which could uh, consolidate society and articulate the separatist attitude. And third is uh, society in general uh, comparing with Donbass, with the revolutionary part of society. People are more rich and they have business, they have trade, port, uh, smuggling. In Donbass, uh, locals who participate in uh, armies of People Republic, they usually represent lower bottom class of society with lower income. <laughs> in Odessa, it's a different situation. So I don't think that now we will have some strong separatist project in Odessa. It's difficult. My question is, I think, primarily to Dr. Matsuzato and uh, Malyarenko. Um, we saw a couple examples of a sort of a certain amount of disjointedness in uh, kind of Russian policy. Um, for instance, uh, backing opposite guys in Abkhazia, um, having the FSB and or GRU run an operation in the Donbass, and then basically having to get bailed out. Uh, by the army, and I'm wondering uh, whether you can speak to, at risk of getting into sort of a prognostication a little bit, whether or not um, you think that there's uh, either an attempt or likely to be an attempt to kind of reduce the sort of disjointedness uh, in Russian policy and attempt to more cohesively work towards certain strategic goals, or whether or not this disjointedness is actually more of a, a feature of the system because it allows for a certain amount of um, plausible deniability, uh, strategic flex flexibility, uh, ability to kind of pursue personal aims or, or, or whatnot. I'd like to ask Professor Matsuzato about Surkov's political technologies. You described them more of a top-down Kremlin approach to the region, like monitoring and in a way controlling it. But where is the like, channels, maybe through these technologies, but maybe other channels like local elites uh, trying to use like Russian presence in their internal fightings and maybe through technologies or other channels because we had like some internal fightings in Luhansk but maybe you can say more about DPR and like r local elites using Russia in their own interest in internal fighting. Yeah. Um, private military companies is a new type of business. Okay? 
and this business is illegal. My first question is, how does state build relations, Russian state build relations with these companies? And second, how profitable is this business? What is the salary for participating in these operations? So what has happened to the Novorossiya ambitions of these early revolutionaries? Is there still some kind of, I don't want to call it civil society, well maybe, that uh, still supports that idea or, or has it died? Mm -hmm. That would be my question. Minor observation to uh, Tatiana, Professor Tatiana Malyarenko's uh, uh, presentation. You said that when peace agreements uh, uh, caused uh, acceleration of, uh, of uh, conflict, is that a cause and effect relationship or something else or combination of things? Uh, other question is to uh, Sergei uh, Sukhan Sukhankin. You mentioned that uh, uh, war is now profitable. So uh, can you just tell us briefly uh, for whom is it profitable and how? I would like to combine mm -hmm. the first question and the second question. I think that the present system of decision making is, uh, I, I would like to uh, evaluate, judge positively. It more facilitates flexibility than um, uh, other more coherent systems. So each Putin's aid have, uh, have their own opinion. And uh, if we look at Putin carefully, he until the last moment, he doesn't decide. So he allows uh, competition between the, his aides, and in the decisive moment, he accepts one of their opinions. So uh, I think this is a very flexible system. But uh, from the viewpoint of, for example, responsibility or parliamentarism, it's very problem prob problematic. But uh, uh, in Russia, this system is working very well. The uh, second question, uh, yes, of course, local elites also uh, try to use this system. There is a very serious differences between old unrecognized states and LD LPR and uh, DPR. Uh, the old unrecognized states enjoyed much more uh, self-government, autonomy of local elites. And for example, in Abkhazia, uh, Surukov uh, intervened and he organized state coup d'etat in 2014. But uh, the old state president came back in the uh, parliamentary elections uh, 16th, in 2016, and he, he became the parliamentary, parliamentary chairman. Uh, in this way, local elite cannot be managed uh, in the same way that Surukov manages LDP and the DP, the DPR re leaders. We should pay more, more attention to uh, uh, discussions of, of local actors. Uh, so this is a methodological problem. We should not rely too much, uh, rely, rely upon Surukov's leaks too much. If we rely upon only Surukov's leaks, we know, we got to know that uh, there was a three ca candidates for the first prime minister, Borodai, uh, Zaharchenko, and uh, Hodakovsky, Hodakovsky. But we don't know, we can't know why uh, Borodai was uh, chosen at that moment. But we, if we interview local leaders, there was a real danger of, of military conflict between the Zaharchenko and uh, Hodakovsky at that time. So uh, Borodai was chosen as a, a first candidate for, uh, candidate for the first prime prime minister this <coughs> way. So my methodological uh, proposal is to combine uh, me method from above uh, and the method from below. So we use uh, both uh, circle leaks and uh, local interviews. In a uh, unrecognized state, this kind of idea continues to live for a long time. And this stimulates what Henry Hale calls uh, regime cycles, regime cycles, because uh, the people have a moment of truth uh, which they should uh, revisit periodically. The DPR by Russia is much more strict than the old uh, unrecognized states. I doubt they can exploit the, some remnants of revolutionary passion. The issue of profitability, well, that's a great question because actually everyone profits, everyone benefits from it. The government, well, the concept of plausible deniability. So by using PMCs, the Russian side is actually able to escape the uh, humiliation of the first Chechen war, second conflict, of Afghanistan. So the people are getting killed, so what? They're mercenaries. 
as Maria Zaharova said, well, just five persons died, and what was the public opinion about that? Well, they had this coming. They had it coming. They're mercenaries. They know what they're fighting for, and they know what they're dying for. They're not just some 18-year-old uh, boys that were being killed in Chechnya. They're trained professionals. This is their profession. Uh, second uh, motivation of the Russian government, geopolitical prestige. Well, in many ways, members of PMCs are acting as military instructors, as was the case during the Soviet Union. If you buy some uh, piece of uh, EV or if you buy some uh, anti-missile complex, for example, or any new type of munition, well, those people can be used uh, as trainers. They can actually teach the locals how to uh, use them. They can provide security to the local chieftain. They can provide the security to, they can train the local armed forces. In Africa, for example, in uh, the CIR, the local president said openly admitted that, yes, we do have Russian mercenaries here. And they're securing, they're ensuring my security, and they're training our, our armed forces. Uh, and the actual money, of course, that is spent on uh, the PMCs, it's uh, nothing in comparison, and I'll elaborate on this later on, on the actual uh, expenditures. And the ordinary people, well, I, do, uh, I don't know whether you have actually been to the Russian rare, uh, if you have been to some uh, distant villages and some uh, not big cities. Uh, well, the life there is uh, kind of despondent. Uh, there is not a lot of opportunities. And all these people who are willingly engaged in this enterprise, all of them have their families to feed. They have uh, kids. Uh, at the same time, they, the, the uh, average wage of there is about 300 years, whereas uh, in uh, the military companies, private military companies, you can get up to $4,000 uh, per month in Syria now. So it's, it's kind of make difference, especially if you did have some uh, military training, prior, prior military training. Get back to your question. Well, first of all, the wages. Well, in Ukraine, they were not that high, of course. Uh, it varied, start from uh, $1,500 per month, which was kind of a lot for many people. In Syria, you can get up to $4,000. Uh, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and in uh, CIR, uh, probably even higher, because uh, this is what they, what they do there is uh, securing mining, securing gold, uranium, uh, and without any fighting. So it's uh, kind of very profitable business. And the state PMC's relationship, well, there are two theories. The first one is about uh, Yevgeny Putin's chief Prigozhin. And I think that it's uh, a bit uh, a bit naive to speak in this uh, in these terms. Uh, we can see how Russian private military companies, how they're mushrooming and how they're expanding their uh, operational theater. So uh, I don't think anyone will believe that uh, a huge structure that is operating from allegedly Libya, CIA, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in Yemen, uh, in Syria, everything is controlled by one, by one sorry, person who is not even an oligarch, who is just a tycoon, not even the richest person in uh, in Russia. There are supporting evidence for the second part, for, the, uh, for another uh, opinion, that there is a consortium of uh, actors that actually controls uh, operations and the system. Well, there are plenty of evidence. First of all, the bill against legalization of private military companies just in 2018. Prior to the bill, everyone was saying, yes, we would legalize private military companies. Uh, when the bill was uh, provided to the state's Duma, everyone was against it, including the Rosguardia, including the Ministry uh, for Foreign Affairs. Everyone against it. Secondly, the uh, training polygon in Moldova that is owned basically the GRU, and I doubt that Prigozhin is superior to the GRU. <laughs> uh, it's something implausible. I think it's enough evidence. There are other, but... I will try to be brief. It's a <coughs> very easy question about peace agreement because um, there is no particular wish to implement this agreement. Ukrainian official openly say that in reintegration of Donbass on condition of Minsk, for example, <coughs> is not profitable for Ukraine because it will, be, it will destabilize Ukraine. And uh, so Ukrainian side, considering Poroshenko and other officials, they, they said that uh, all agreements are profitable for Russia only. So for Ukraine, there is no, no interest to implement them. 
And also there is no uh, public support for reintegration of Donbass on conditions of Minsk agreement. So uh, Ukraine, there is no will, willness, will from Ukrainian side <laughs> to implement, and Russia increased pressure. So violence uh, increased and escalation increased because Ukraine did not want to, to, to consider the implementation of this agreement. More difficult question about Russian decision making. I cannot give a very uh, clear, comprehensive answer, but I will quote one expert whom we interview, and he said that Russia and Ukraine in this war, they play different games. Ukraine play, play short-term game because it fight for independence and have to protect interest in short period of time. Russia playing a long time game and all um, losses of Russia in result of sanctions, uh, they will be compensated by geopolitical wins. Russia will get Crimea with strategically important territory. Sanction will end in some 20, 30 years, but Crimea will remain. Russia will get Donbass, at least it's about 3 million of ethnical Russian people or Ukrainian who feel that Russian speakers. With demographic problems in Russia, it's also not so bad assets. So it, Russia managed to reach goals uh, to, fire, to, to make all world uh, consider it interest with not so huge investments. The, everyone afraid of Russia and everyone want to think about <laughs> Russia, but in fact it's country with very small economy, with decreasing population, with huge so social problems, but it's a kind of global evil now. Maybe, who knows, maybe it's a goal of a new policy of Russia. Well, on that cheery note, I'd like to thank our speakers for a really stimulating session.